In this section, we will be delving into the lives of three famous investors, all of whom shaped the world of finance and proved that it is possible to make money investing in the stock market. If we plan on becoming good investors, it's absolutely crucial we study all these men closely. The first investor we'll take a look at is Warren Buffett, who is likely the most renowned financier alive. Warren's career in the investment world has made him the second richest person alive, with a net worth of over $60 billion. Warren Buffett was born in 1930 in a place called Omaha, located in the state of Nebraska in the United States. His father was a stockbroker, and Warren has often credited his initial interest in the markets to his dad. Warren began his career in finance at an incredibly young age, when he bought three shares of a company called City Service at the age of 11. This first move into business led him to launch a newspaper route at 13. From there, he attended the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the University of Nebraska, where he obtained his undergraduate degree in business administration. Consequently, he ended up pursuing a master's in economics at the prestigious Columbia University in New York. It is there where he met the celebrated investor, Benjamin Graham. Graham soon became Warren's mentor and taught him the concept of value investing which is the investment strategy that Mr. Buffett continues to use to this day. In 1954, Graham offered Buffett a job as an analyst at his firm Graham Newman Corporation. And by 1956, Buffett was out on his own when he founded Buffett Partnership Limited, a firm that was created with $100,000 in capital reserves. A few years later, he would end up acquiring the business he is most famous for owning these days, Berkshire Hathaway. Funnily enough, at the time, Berkshire Hathaway was actually a textile business in severe financial distress. Buffett took it over and turned it completely around, making it a platform to buy other companies. This made Berkshire a holding company. Through the years, Buffett would acquire and invest in other businesses, which has led to Berkshire becoming the eighth largest company in the world. So how did Warren Buffett make such profitable investments? As mentioned earlier, Benjamin Graham taught Warren the concept of value investing, buying high quality businesses at cheap prices, essentially betting on stocks whose intrinsic price, so whose fair value is higher than the current market price. This, of course, is much easier said than done. Finding good investments takes a lot of time and very careful analysis. One of the traits that separates Warren from the average investor is that he is willing to ignore anything that goes on in the stock market and just focus on the business itself. Buffett believes the markets can be emotional, like a human. One day the market is up, the other day it's down. The goal is not to worry when stocks drop and not be overly happy when stocks are up. In the end, as long as the business is good, you will profit. Here are some of the traits that the companies he invests in possess. The first is great management. A company cannot perform well unless it is managed by experts who act with integrity and are honest with shareholders. In many cases, good management is what can turn a lousy business into a high growth company. At the same time, management should be shareholder oriented and attempt to maximize shareholder value. There are many ways a company could do so, but these mainly take place in the form of dividends or share buybacks, which is basically when a company buys back its own shares, which increases the stock price. If management is shareholder oriented, you can rest assured that it will always do whatever it can do to actually boost the stock price. Warren looks for businesses he actually understands. He constantly talks about staying within your circle of confidence. If you do not understand what a company does and cannot speak about its operation with a certain level of confidence, you shouldn't invest in it at all. 
For example, Warren does not invest in technology companies as he does not profoundly understand them. The company should create a high quality product that entices consumers to keep on purchasing. Product is key if aiming for stable and high growth. In some way, shape or form, a business should have an advantage relative to competitors. If not, any other rival can come in and snatch up market share. Last but not least, a business should have a steady revenue stream with predictable and growing earnings. Earnings are vital if aiming for high returns. One of the topics Mr. Buffett talks about most is his admiration of companies with wide economic moats. An economic moat, which is a word invented by Warren himself, represents a factor that protects a company from competitors, whether it is a technology unique to the company, a patent, or even simply a strong brand name. One of my favorite Buffett quotes is, in business, I look for economic castles protected by unbreachable moats. The purpose of a big moat is to really maintain demand for the business's products over a very long period of time. So now let's take a look at some of Buffett's most profitable investments. One of Berkshire Hathaway's largest positions is in Coca-Cola, the manufacturer of the popular soft drink. The position itself is worth over $15 billion. Think about that. With so much money, you could choose between buying American Airlines or the entirety of the NBA Basketball League. Buffett made his first investment in Coca-Cola in 1988, over 28 years ago. Back then, people criticized his move and said that another competitor would enter and steal Coke's market share. Well, Coke has continued to be very successful and has generated more than an 800% return for Mr. Buffett. As we talked about just before, Coca-Cola is a great example of a company with a wide economic moat. Coca-Cola's brand name is so strong that it continues to dominate the market for soft drinks. In addition, Coke is a product that Mr. Buffett can easily understand. Finding businesses whose operations you can actually comprehend helps tremendously in figuring out whether they will continue to thrive in the long run. Another one of Buffett's profitable positions is in Wells Fargo, an American financial services company. He began amassing his position in 1990 and has continued to accumulate his investment, which now stands at over $16 billion. This means he owns roughly 8.5% of the company whose market capitalization is around $200 billion. In the last 24 years in which he has owned Wells Fargo, the stock has moved up over 9,000%. Talk about a great return. Buffett initially got into the business during the savings and loan crisis, which was a financial downturn that impacted large banks around 20 years ago. As I mentioned earlier, unless a crisis has a direct impact on how a business performs, Buffett disregards the movements of the market. So while others were selling, he was buying. This is probably one of the best examples, which shows why Warren Buffett is regarded as one of the greatest investors of all time. To sum things up, it's pretty obvious to see why Warren Buffett is such a legend. His ability to focus on an underlying business instead of being caught up by all the fuss in the markets is admirable and is something that countless investors attempt to replicate. What's most fascinating about Mr. Buffett is his keenness to educate the next generation of investors. A large portion of today's most successful fund managers relies on his conception of value investing, which were initially taught to Buffett by Benjamin Graham. So if we hope to become good investors and maybe even one day become the next Warren Buffett, it is important for us to find high quality businesses that trade at a lower price than their true value.
Another top-notch investor who was at the same time responsible for the birth of a different form of investing is Philip Fisher, who is considered to be the father of growth investing. Fisher got his start out of Stanford Business School when he dropped out in 1928, a year before the market collapse of 1929. He launched an investment firm at the age of 24 and focused on investments in Silicon Valley companies, especially in companies that invested a lot of capital into research and development, as well as building innovative new products. In his mind, these were the types of businesses that could generate spectacular returns for a shareholder. Fisher's assessment of a business wasn't merely based on numbers and charts, he placed a great emphasis on a firm's management and ability to deal with incoming problems. He also attempted to comprehend the organizational culture of a company. Fisher was very disciplined and had developed a 15-point checklist, which he went through before making any investment. The checklist will be attached to this lecture as an article. What's interesting about Fisher is that he began his investing career as a value investor, much like Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham. Through the years, though, he began to refine his style, especially after the stock market crash of 1929. After these events, he felt that some stocks might be incredibly cheap for a good reason, and that many of the counting tools that value investors employ do not take into account any extraordinary problems a company might have. As such, Fisher focused on any and all of a company's growth factors. So essentially, while value investing involves finding high-quality companies that are undervalued by the market, growth investing takes place when betting on stocks that are in the midst of moving higher. The key difference between both is that growth investors don't mind paying a higher price for a good business. So what did Fisher look for in a company? Well, his approach is a little tougher to describe than that of a value investor since it relies more on his personal thoughts on the future of a particular industry or technology. In general, however, there were a few factors he would pay very close attention to. The first, much like Warren Buffett, is that he would seek out firms with great management. As you can start to tell, management is vital to the success of a company. That said, unlike how a value investor might attempt to find more predictable and stable management, a growth investor will focus on how innovative management is. A good example could be Steve Jobs who pioneered many of Apple's best-selling products, including the iPod and the iPhone. To justify high growth, management must push out and release novel products on a regular basis. In addition, as mentioned earlier, Fisher liked companies that put money towards research and development. Without investing money towards the future, how else is a company meant to perform well? Probably the key tenet of the growth investing philosophy is growth itself, especially growth in earnings. So higher earnings come about through more revenue and less costs. A company whose margins are low are especially of interest. Low margin basically means that it doesn't cost a lot to produce a product, which of course is essential for high profits. As we talked about in a previous lecture, earnings are another feature that drive stock prices up. Fisher would invest in companies that he believed could grow earnings and most importantly, sustain that growth. Probably Fisher's most famous investment was in Motorola, a company that I am sure you must have heard of at least once in the past. Motorola was an American multinational telecommunications company that focused on producing telephones and wireless technologies. The company was recently broken up into two separate firms. The business was founded in 1928, and back then it focused mostly on creating televisions and radios. Due to its high growth, 
Fisher became interested and initially invested in the company in 1955, over 61 years ago. Prior and after Fisher's investment, the company grew its revenue at a stellar pace of over 68%. Motorola continued to innovate throughout the next few decades after Fisher's investment and ended up becoming one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world. If Fisher held on to the stake until the year 2000, he would have generated a 6,000% return. This points to the importance of long-term investing. This is something that Warren Buffett agrees with. Investing for the long run presents the greatest opportunities to generate high returns. Short-term investing, in other words trading, can be detrimental to an inexperienced market participant. As such, we can learn much from legends such as Philip Fisher and Warren Buffett, who were able to do so well for so long. Speaking of Warren Buffett, Buffett himself said that his investment philosophy is 15% Fisher. So, in the end, even though Philip Fisher chose to follow the route of growth investing over value investing, he became incredibly successful and has influenced countless individuals. His approach of picking great businesses with high quality management and high earnings growth is very similar to that of a value investor, even though his focus would be on growth instead of price. There's no set rule for doing well in the markets, but Fisher just proves how it doesn't really matter what strategy you follow as long as you are disciplined and look for fundamentally good businesses that will continue to thrive in the future. So that's all for Philip Fisher. Peter Lynch is undoubtedly one of the greatest investors who's ever lived, not only for the stellar returns he produced, but also for his passion to educate others about investing. While at the helm of Fidelity's Magellan Fund, he generated a 29.2% annual return from 1977 to 1990. This record is unheard of anywhere else on Wall Street. So let's dive into this incredibly interesting man's life and explore what led him to become such a great investor. Peter Lynch was born in 1951 in the state of Massachusetts. He attended the local Boston College as an undergraduate, which is where he discovered his interest for the markets. As a sophomore, he used his savings to buy 100 shares of Flying Tiger Airlines at $8 per share. Soon enough, the stock rose to $80, making him 10 times his money. He later attended the Wharton School to obtain an MBA. Lynch began his career at Fidelity Investments, one of the largest mutual funds in the United States. Lynch joined Fidelity Investments as an analyst, but quickly rose through the ranks to become head of the unknown Magellan Fund, which at the time had $18 million in assets. By the time Peter was done with the fund in 1990, his legendary record had attracted over $14 billion in assets with roughly 1,000 stocks in the fund's portfolio. As outlined in his book, One Up on Wall Street, Lynch has a very specific way of analyzing stocks. You could say that he blends both value investing and growth investing into one, looking for situations in which a company can significantly outperform the market. Though he does not concern himself too much with the price of a stock, he does place a big emphasis on companies that can consistently grow. During his time at Fidelity, he was able to pick over 100 stocks that multiplied his investment by 10. Since Peter Lynch could be considered part value investor, part growth investor, all the features we looked at for Buffett and Fisher apply to him. Nevertheless, Lynch does have a unique twist in the way he looks at companies. One of the key tenets of Lynch's philosophy is investing in what you know. This is something we heard Warren Buffett say countless times, but I can't stress this enough. If you don't understand what a company is doing before investing in it, then it's like betting on the slowest horse in the race and hoping that the other horses ate bad hay. There's little point investing in Apple if all you know about it is that it produces phones and computers 
and you don't actually understand what impact something like Moore's Law will have on the cost of production of storage and semiconductors. These are obviously complicated questions, but crucial to answer if you really want to engage with the company and most importantly, be able to actually understand its financial performance. So you might ask, what are other possible investment areas if I don't truly understand what Apple does? Simple, pick something you know, anything. It can be a supermarket chain or a multinational hotel company. As long as you understand it, you'll not only be interested in what the company is doing, but you'll read through the reports it releases with ease. Obviously, it doesn't mean that you understand it that the business itself is a good investment, but at least it will help you comprehend the financials better in order to eventually make a better financial decision. At the same time, Lynch provides another important piece of advice. He believes that everyone has knowledge that they can use to profit in the stock market and that that knowledge is all around us. For example, if you're a construction worker and you see that you're beginning to use a different type of cement because of its superior quality, you should look into the company that produces that cement, especially if this is a trend you see at all construction sites. Or if you're a student and you realize that all your friends are suddenly going and eating at Subway instead of McDonald's, that's certainly worth looking into. People do not realize this, but they are typically ground zero when it comes to new products and new offerings. You just have to keep your eyes wide open to new trends that could be sweeping the market. Jim Cramer, who was the star of the financial show Mad Money, once talked about how his daughter introduced him to the fast food business Chipotle before it became big, since all her friends were eating there. This is the type of information that can help you spot winners before they become giants. After you've found a company you believe can perform well into the future, it's necessary to look at its financial results in closer detail, especially the income statement and balance sheet. Using the Lynch methodology, you should always focus on growth expectations for a stock. You can do so using the PEG ratio, which looks at valuation in relation to the growth in earnings. Ideally, a stock will have a PEG of under one, which indicates the stock might be undervalued. Another metric to consider is the percentage of assets and cash. Strong cash flow and conservative management of assets gives the company the opportunity to thrive regardless of the state of the market. It is at the same time positive to have low debt in relation to equity. These are all measurements you can find on a company's financial filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, all of which is available online. And these are things we will talk about later too. Once you have determined whether the company is set to outperform over the coming years, you need to create a story for yourself. This is something that Lynch did before making an investment. Essentially, you want to prepare a five minute speech that you rehearse in your head, whereby you talk about the company itself, why it is a good investment, what it needs to do to continue to perform well, and where you hope it is heading. You might want to take note of the story you end up building and check up on the company every once in a while to verify it stick to the narrative. In general, however, these are the six types of stories that can apply to different companies. The first are slow growers, which are companies that are expected to grow slightly faster than the gross domestic product, which is typically around 2%. These companies initially started as fast growers, but slowed down over time. For example, large car companies like Ford or General Motors were fast growers, but as they became bigger, their growth slowed down. Given their huge size, these companies typically pay large dividends. Stalwarts are companies like Coke, which see 10 to 12% annual growth in earnings. So even though they grow faster than slow growers, they are not as large. Fast growers are small aggressive new companies that grow at 20 to 25% a year. Peter Lynch says that you need to find fast growers that have robust balance sheets with lots of assets and that make large profits. So cyclicals go up and down depending on the economic condition. Automobile manufacturers and airlines are good examples of these. If the economy is thriving, people spend more money on travel and buying new cars. 
This differs from stalwarts like Coke. If you make less money, one of the first expenses you'll cut is travel and leisure. Turnarounds, on the other hand, are companies that have recently performed poorly but are starting to pick up. Although they are hard to find, they can present great buying opportunities. Finally, asset plays are businesses that are valuable mainly because of all the assets they own. The most typical example of these are real estate companies. You need to keep in mind that a proper investment portfolio should try to mix things up and have a bit of each. All right, now let's take a look at some of Peter's most famous investments. The first has to be Ford. Ford is undeniably one of the most renowned companies in the world, and certainly one of the best run. Lynch invested in Ford when the stock traded at $1 and saw it surge to over $14 during his lifetime. That's a 1,300% return. Another famous investment of his was Philip Morris, which at the time was the largest tobacco company in the United States. Following studies that showed smoking can kill, Philip Morris began diversifying its holdings and eventually became a major company in the food business. This led to its stock growing at an annualized 18% between 1970 and 2000. In the end, what's interesting about Peter Lynch's investment philosophy is really how it combines different strategies and adds its own twist. Lynch wants investors to really understand what they invest in, which is one of the reasons why he encourages people to invest in what they know. At the same time, he seeks to empower prospective shareholders by enticing them to keep their eyes open for possible investment opportunities that might be anywhere around them. You can't forget, a share is a piece of a company after all. So buying into a business when they really take off can present tremendous opportunities, as was proven by Lynch himself. So this concludes the lectures on legendary investors and how they became successful. At the basis of investing is having the ability to read through a company's financial reports. I'll be honest with you and say that you'll probably not find this part too interesting, but it actually turns out this is probably the most important lecture. Knowing the ins and outs of financial statements is actually what distinguishes great investors from mediocre ones. I'll try to simplify things and leave out some of the more complicated terminology throughout this lecture. So let's dive in. As we talked about in the IPO lesson, every public company is required by law to report and disclose its financial information to the public. In the United States, all the information is available on the Securities and Exchange Commission's website. The Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, is the main organization charged with regulating the financial markets. They're kind of like a financial police, and they aim to make investing as fair as possible. As you can guess, to make informed investment decisions, you'll ideally need to go through the material a company publishes to really get a grasp of what it does and how it performs financially. Financial reports might seem incredibly complicated, but it turns out they are relatively simple if you understand their overall structure and some of the more complicated words they use. The important thing for you to remember is that every financial filing is split into three key sections, the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement. So let's start with a balance sheet. This basically consists of assets and liabilities and applies to companies as much as they apply to us personally. Anything that has value is an asset, whether it's a computer, a house, clothes, or a book. Liability, on the other hand, is a debt or obligation. This can include your credit card bills or student loan debts. When you subtract liabilities from assets, you will get your personal net worth, which are the net assets. Your personal net worth is just as important as the net worth of a company. However, investors typically never refer to a company's assets minus liabilities as net worth, and they instead use a fancy word called shareholders equity. A balance sheet is important for many reasons. It can give an investor an easy look at how a company manages its finances. To illustrate the example, let's look at a company called Banana Motors Production, run by a CEO named Steve. Banana Motors is a startup automobile manufacturer. 
To better understand the situation, let's dig into the details of Banana Motors' balance sheet, starting with its assets. Something you'll notice in every financial statement for any company is how there are two columns with figures, in this case 2015 and 2014. This is mainly done by the company to help investors look at how a firm progresses over time and year by year. Assets are split into three main categories, current assets, other assets, and property. All these add up to the total assets. Current assets are anything that are valuable and can be converted to cash quickly and within one year. Obviously cash is the most important current asset, but there are also other things like marketable securities, which can be shares the company owns that can be sold immediately for cash as well as inventories. So the two cars Steve built. Adding them up would give you $500,000, Banana Motors' total assets for 2015. When comparing the company's performance to the previous year, you'll notice that its assets have shrunk year by year. To find out why, look no further than the inventories, where you'll see that the value has fallen from $300,000 to $200,000. From that, we can figure out that Steve sold one of his cars for $100,000. At the same time, we see that cash has gone up by 50000 so we can tell that Steve kept half of what he made from the sale of the car and spent the other half. Now, let's take a look at the company's liabilities. Liabilities are split under three key sections, current liabilities, long-term liabilities, and deferred income taxes. Current liabilities are the same as current assets, except while current assets provide value within a year, current liabilities are obligations that have to be paid within a year. So while one adds, the other subtracts. Current assets are made up of accounts payable, which are things Banana Motors still has to pay for, like tires that are used for the car, payroll, which is the salary Steve pays his employees, as well as taxes, which are pretty self-explanatory. Total liabilities have increased by $5,000 due to a rise in short-term expenses. So, why are large liabilities bad for a company? Well, in Banana Motors' case, the firm is very limited in what it can and can't do. It's like if you personally took a loan to buy a house, so a mortgage. If you had to make consistent payments back to the bank, you wouldn't have the freedom to, for example, switch to a nicer but less safe job. A lot of debt restricts people and companies alike and prevents them from expanding, not to mention that too much debt decreases profits. The last part of a balance sheet is actually shareholders' equity, but through our discussion we will cover this. All right, let's review Banana Motors' balance sheet. As assets have gone down, liabilities have moved slightly higher year over year, which is negative for the business. That said, given how large assets are relative to liabilities, it shouldn't be anything to worry about in the short term. As long as Steve is able to keep up production, he should continue to thrive. Let's move on to the next section. The income statement is the second part of a financial filing and contains two key metrics for an investor, revenues and expenses. While the balance sheet is a measure of the company's overall strength, the income statement gives an investor a better understanding of how the company is receiving and spending the money it has. The revenues of a business are what it takes in and the expenditures are what it takes out, so costs. If you want to figure out whether the company can grow in the future, this is where you'll get that information. The income statement also indicates one of the most important measures for an investor, earnings. As we have already talked about several times, at the end of the day, it's all about earnings, and especially earnings growth. A stock cannot advance without the underlying business earning more money. In the income statement, earnings are listed as net income. To illustrate the income statement, let's use a pizza restaurant chain called Pizza Land. Please do keep in mind, however, that each of the three parts of the financial statement is interrelated. The revenue part is pretty simple. The company generated $500,000 through its stores, which is $100,000 more than the year prior. Expenses are listed as operating costs and expenses and comprise of restaurant-related expenses as well as general and selling expenses. 
As we can directly see, there has been an increase of $100,000 between 2014 and 2015, meaning that as revenue moves up, so do expenses. This is certainly not a positive thing, but is what happens to many businesses. In this case, we see most of the money is going towards employee payments, or payroll. A solution to this is to pay employees a constant amount. Last but not least, there's income. As you can see, there's a difference between operating income and net income. Amongst other things, net income takes into account the taxes a business pays. In this case, Pizza Land pays 50% in combined taxes and interest, which leaves it with $50,000 in net income. The real negative about Pizza Land's financial position is really that it is seeing no growth in net income. Someone like Warren Buffett or Peter Lynch would want to invest in a stable company that increases its profits over time. In this case, it's not happening. At the same time, if the management of the company can solve the issues of increasing labor costs, then net income will increase significantly. Only then would it prove to be a solid investment. The last part of a financial statement is the cash flow statement, and it is split into three main parts, cash flow from operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities. Overall, cash from operating activities is what is taken in, and cash from investing and financing is what is taken out. Let's take a look at the cash flow statements using another company called Blueberry Computers, which is a computer manufacturer. First off is the cash from operating activities. At the top we see net income, followed by the two main categories of cash provided by operations, charges and credits, and changes in working capital. Charges and credits includes things like depreciation, which is how the value of an asset decreases. Companies can write off a portion of that decline for tax purposes, which in turn increases their net income. Next are the changes in working capital. Accounts receivables are what the company is owed, and accounts payable are what the company still owes. Here, we can see that cash decreases since someone owes $50,000 to Blueberry Computers. Something really, really important to note is that in accounting, whenever a negative number is expressed, we always use brackets. So the $50,000 is, in fact, negative. As we said earlier, cash flow from investing typically takes out money from a business, which is why the figures are negative. Capital expenditures refers to investments made on machinery for the business, in this case, automatic assembly lines to produce the computers. Investing is essential to keep a business up to date. Finally, cash flow from financing refers to how a business actually finances or funds its activities. As we looked at in the lecture on IPOs, businesses raise capital either by issuing debt or by issuing shares. Overall, Blueberry has seen an increase of 30,000 in cash outflows from financing from 2014. Overall, Blueberry Computers' cash flow statement proves that the business is stable and running smoothly. Though net income is staying flat, the business is investing more money for future growth, which is surely positive. Certainly, we would need to look at Blueberry's balance sheet and income statement to determine its worthiness as an investment. But based solely on its cash flow, you could expect that it would pay a large dividend, but wouldn't see much growth in share price. To sum things up, the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement are all incredibly important and show different parts of a business's financials. While the balance sheet showcases what a business has through its assets and liabilities, the income statement focuses on how it spends its money through revenues and expenses. Finally, the cash flow statement shows how money moves in and out of the business. The ideal company would support many financial features, including high net income growth, a high level of assets relative to liabilities, as well as a high degree of cash inflows. In the end, these are the types of businesses worth looking into as an investor. In trading and investing, there are many different types of strategies that market participants employ. In this lecture, we will be looking at some of the larger and most important types. The two main types of investing are fundamental and technical analysis. We'll be starting off with fundamental. 
Fundamental analysis is extremely broad. You could say that fundamental analysis is the cornerstone of investing. The biggest part of fundamental analysis involves delving into company financial statements and looking at different aspects of a company, such as the revenue, assets, expenses, liabilities, etc. This is most definitely geared towards the mathematical side of trading. It involves a wide range of calculations to figure out stock prices in the future. According to Investopedia, fundamental analysis is a technique that attempts to determine a security's value by focusing on underlying factors uh, that affect a company's actual business and its future prospects. Fundamental analysis can be performed on industries or the economy as a whole. So as opposed to technical analysis, which we will be looking at after, uh, which involves analyzing based on price movements, fundamental analysis goes beyond that and looks at the overall well-being of a company. Some questions a fundamental analyst might ask are, is the company's revenue growing? Is it making profit? Uh, is it able to repay its debt? How does it compare to industry competitors? There are some of the few, but basically you would look at whether the company's stock is a good investment. So the intrinsic value. Fundamental analysis is based on the concept that the price of a stock does not fully reflect its real value. In the financial world, that real value is called the intrinsic value. So let's take a small example. Say Microsoft is trading at $28 per share. After much analysis, you figure out that its intrinsic value, how much it's really worth, stands at $34 per share. That is 21% higher than its current value. In the eyes of a fundamental analyst, that would present a great buying opportunity, as the stock would be what we would call undervalued. In the opposite case, where the current price is $34, but you find out that it's actually worth $28, you would say that it's overvalued. The largest assumption in fundamental analysis is that in the long run, the stock will always reflect the fundamentals. But no one really knows how long the long run is. It could be a period of days or even years. So that is what fundamental analysis is really about. By focusing on a company or the economy, an investor can determine its intrinsic value and find opportunities to buy or sell. If all goes as planned, the investment should pay off over time as the market catches up to the fundamentals. On the other side of fundamental analysis is technical analysis. Unlike fundamental analysis, technical analysts, or technicians as we would call them, don't care about the value of the company or the company as a whole. All they really care about is the price movement in the market. They employ lots of fancy and exotic tools to study the supply and demand in the market in order to attempt to determine the direction or trend in the future. Another way of describing them is that they try to understand the emotions of the market by studying the market itself, as opposed to its components, like fundamental analysts do. Technicians evaluate stocks by analyzing the statistics generated by market activity, such as prices and volume. They do not attempt to measure the intrinsic value, but instead use charts and tools to figure out the pattern. Technical analysis is based on three assumptions. Number one, the market discounts everything. Number two, price moves in trends. And number three, History tends to repeat itself. Technical analysts only consider price movements and ignore the fundamental factors of a company. The reason for this is that technicians assume that at any given time, a stock's price reflects everything that has or could affect the company, including the fundamental factors. They believe that the company's fundamentals, as well as market psychology, are priced into the stock. Therefore, there's no need to analyze the company itself. 
In technical analysis, stock price movements are set to move in trends. That means that when a trend has been located, the future price will move in the same direction as the trend. The last important idea of technical analysis is that history repeats itself. The repetitivity is due to market psychology. Market participants tend to provide a consistent reaction to similar market activities. Technicians use chart patterns to analyze market movements and understand trends. Technical versus fundamental analysis. In a way, you could say that it's like comparing financial statements versus charts. A fundamental analyst tries to determine the intrinsic value of a company by looking at its statements and determining whether it is over or undervalued. Technicians believe analyzing a company's financial statements is redundant as it is all accounted for in the stock price. Therefore, they place the efficient market hypothesis at the top of their beliefs. Usually, fundamental analysis is used when you're looking towards the long term in a stock, while technical analysis is used for short term trading. Even though they might seem contrary to each other, they can still both coexist. It can actually give the trader investor a higher chance of success as he or she can analyze both the long and short term of a stock. So, this concludes this lecture. Thank you for watching. At the end of the day, making money in the stock market depends entirely on your investment strategy. By now we have looked at some of the greatest investors of all time and how they were able to generate high returns. And we've also had the opportunity to explore financial statements and discuss why they are important. Now we're going to tie everything in by looking at one of the most popular ways of investing, value investing. As we talked about with Buffett, value investing involves looking for undervalued stocks whose prices are cheap relative to what they are actually worth. The most important tool a value investor can have is time. If you don't invest time and effort into looking for companies, you won't reap the benefits. Here's Warren Buffett speaking to a group of Columbia Business School students and talking about the importance of investing time to do your research. Hi, I'm Brian Diefenbacher. I'm a second year student. Uh, Mr. Buffett, it's great to see you again. I was on the trip to Omaha last month. Thank you for hosting us. My question is, how would you recommend an individual investor who follows a Graham and Dodd philosophy to allocate their capital today? Well, if they, it depends whether they're going to be an active investor. Uh, Graham distinguished between the defensive and the enterprising investor. If you're going to spend a lot of time on investment, you know, I just advise looking at as many things as possible and you will find some bargains. And, and, uh, and when you find them, you have to act. Uh, uh, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it, it hasn't changed at all since I was here in 1950-51. Uh, uh, and it won't change the rest of my life. So you just you start turning pages. When I got out of school, I turned every page in Moody's, 10,000 some pages twice, you know, looking for companies. And you have to find them yourself. The world isn't going to tell you about great deals. You, you have to find them yourself. And that takes a fair amount of time. So if you're not going to do that, if you're just going to be a passive investor, then I just advise an index fund bought consistently over a long period of time. The one thing I will tell you is that the worst investment you can have is cash. Everybody's talking about cash being king and all that sort of thing. But I, most of you don't look like you're overburdened with cash anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, uh, you know, cash is going to become worth less over time. But good businesses are going to become worth more over time. And you don't want to pay too much for them, so you have to have some discipline about, about what you pay. Uh, but the thing to do is find a good business and stick with it. Does that mean you think that we are through the roughest times? Of the, you, you'd always kept a cash hoard around, too. Well, that... we, we always keep enough cash around so I feel very comfortable and don't worry about sleeping at night. But, uh, but it's not because I like cash as an investment. Uh, cash is a bad investment over time. Uh, 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 but you always want to have enough so that nobody else can determine your future, essentially. I, the worst, the financial panic is behind us. The economic spillout, which came to some extent from that financial panic, is, is it's, it's still with us. It will end. I don't know whether it will end tomorrow or next week or next month uh, uh, or maybe a year, but it, it won't go on forever. And to sit around and try and pick the bottom, 
people were trying to do that last March. And, and you know, the bottom hadn't come in unemployment, the bottom hadn't come in business, but the bottom had come in stocks. So don't pass up something that's attractive today because you hope you're going to find something way more attractive tomorrow. Let's recap what Buffett and other value investors look for. The first trait is that the company should be simple and easy to understand. We've talked about this many times, but it's something you can't forget if you plan on doing well. A good example of this is that Warren Buffett himself actually missed out on the tech bubble of 2000, as he didn't understand what most of those companies were doing. As you probably know, by 2001, most of those tech companies lost over 70% of their share prices, while others even went bankrupt. The second trait is that you should look for companies with a strong brand image. Businesses like Coca-Cola or McDonald's are known across the world and have a stable customer base. These are the types of companies that are deemed safer than the average and that can present tremendous value. Next is to look at earnings. Again, Coke and McDonald's have seen increasing earnings over a long period of time, which is what fueled their stock prices to move higher. Last but not least is management. The reason why management is so important is that whoever leads the company also determines how it will perform financially. A good CEO can make a business prosper during an entire lifetime and can even rescue a company during tougher times. Just remember, when you invest in a business, you're also investing in the management team. All right, so how do you determine whether a company is overvalued or undervalued? There are two main ways to do this, either by relative or absolute valuation. For the purposes of this video, we will focus on relative valuation. Basically, relative value involves comparing a company to its competitors in the same industry, and we do this using ratios. There are many metrics you can apply, but one of the most important ones is the price to earnings ratio, or PE ratio. You get the figure by dividing price by earnings. The rule of thumb is that the higher the P-E ratio compared to the competitors in the industry, the more overvalued the stock is, while the lower the ratio, the more undervalued it is. Let's say Apple is trading at a P-E of 20, which we can get by dividing the stock price of 200 by the earnings of $10 per share. On its own, we can't really understand its value, but if we compare it to Microsoft, whose PE is 25, we can determine that Apple is undervalued relative to its peer. Another important metric is the price to book ratio. In general, book value is a rough estimate of how much a company is worth. The abbreviation for this is PB and is calculated by dividing price over book value. If Apple's PB is 14 and Microsoft's is 16, Apple is undervalued in terms of book value relative to Microsoft. Finally, the last crucial metric that I like to look at is the debt to equity ratio. As we saw from some of the legendary investors, they warn against investing in companies that carry too much debt, so businesses that have taken out lots of loans. The debt to equity ratio looks at the amount of debt in relation to companies' shareholders' equity which, if you remember, is calculated by subtracting liabilities from assets and is the net worth of a company. The lower the ratio, the better. If Apple has a debt to equity ratio of 0.31 and Microsoft is at 0.33, then Apple is more attractive as it carries less debt. Now, let's look at another way of figuring out value. This one's a little bit more tricky and can be incredibly complex, so I'll simplify it as much as possible. Remember how we talked about the intrinsic value of a stock? If you don't remember, the intrinsic value is the true value of a stock, and value investors try to buy when the current market price is below the intrinsic price. Right now, we'll try to figure out a form of intrinsic price for Apple using random numbers. Let's say Apple sells 100 million products per year at an average price of $1,000 each, making $100 billion in sales. To make those 100 million products, they have to spend $800, which are the costs. This means they are personally making $200 per device, so $20 billion. Obviously, Apple is a business, and businesses want to grow. Let's say that Apple sells 5% additional product each year at the price of $1,000. So next year they make $22 billion, and the year after that they make $24.2 billion. 
For the next 39 to 40 years, we predict they will make 337.5 billion, which we get by adding up all those figures. If you divide that by the total number of shares, we get a value of $55 per share. That is the intrinsic price. If we were to say the current market price is $40, that represents upside of 37.5%. This means that Apple is undervalued. As you can see, the most important factor for a business is growth and growth in earnings. If a business can consistently grow its profits, higher stock prices will follow. That's pretty much it for value investing. If you're just starting out, I advise you focus on relative valuation and figuring out how a company compares to competitors in the industry. It's not only an easy way of valuing a business, but it can give you a very precise indication of what investors are willing to pay for peers in the industry. Absolute valuation and figuring out an intrinsic price is also very useful, but at the same time much more complex and requires you to forecast free cash flow and determine things like the weighted average cost of capital. These are things that you will learn with time and as you look at more companies. In the end, as Warren Buffett himself said, only by investing time in your research will you be able to do well as an investor.